Welcome to what I hope I know is going to be a wonderful conversation together. Those of you I haven't met uh, over the last year, so I'm Michael Hastings, uh, Professor of Leadership here with my co-professor Boyd Craig. We both share the Stephen Covey leadership responsibility together. Uh, I'm a member of the House of Lords in the United Kingdom, but I'm also a dad, so just call me whatever name you prefer. My children just go grunt. Anyway, our pleasure is to welcome Indra Nui. We've all heard so much about Indra, and I'm going to try and pull out a few extra things. So if I miss it in the course of this conversation, feel free to pick up on it. But let me just start, if I can, Indra, because um, anybody who spends any time looking at your life realizes that you've really enjoyed it. And one of the things that comes over from some of your uh, postings, your online postings, is your great love of music. And you talked in one of them recently about your friend Mary. You said she was funny and endlessly adventurous. More importantly, she had a shiny acoustic guitar. <laughs> so just talk to us about this great love of music that you've had. Well, I grew up in a family where music sort of was all around us. I think everybody in my family is a singer. Cousins, second cousins, uh, many of them gone on to great um, fame. And so you couldn't escape music. Um, but I was not a good uh, Indian classical singer, which is really the music that was all around us. My sister was, and I was very competitive with her, so I decided I had to distinguish myself in a different genre of music that was so different that nobody else will sort of invade my space, but still music. What would you call that genre? <laughs> <laughs> Anything but Indian, South Indian classical right, music. Right. No, I had to learn South Indian classical because it was believed you had to learn that in order to get married. That was the expectation right. in those days. So you showed up at the uh, class when the te teacher came home to give you lessons. My sister was a great student. I was just looking at the minutes to see when I could go out to play again. So I was not a very good student uh, of, of Indian classical music. So when Mary joined uh, Holy Angel Convent. Sorry, we can't I thought you turned it on. The green light is on. It may need to be a little closer. Hello? But can you hear me? No? No. Can you hear me now? Hello? Please, Oh, it's not working. Ah. Uh, I'm so sorry. sorry. That's all right. It was on, such a wonderful answer. <laughs> <laughs> I know what's never going to do. Check. Yeah. All right. <laughs> and so Mary shows up, the daughter of an army person. And um, in a convent school, I was in an Irish convent school. Mm. And um, uh, in Holy Angels Convent, Mary shows up and she's playing the guitar. And I go, now I know what my calling is. So Mary teaches me some basic songs from another old guitar that I picked up. And the rest is history. And you still play the guitar now? Uh, you know, those days I couldn't afford to buy a guitar yeah. because my parents wouldn't buy it anyway for me. Um, now I own more guitars than I ever play, but I look yeah. at them. I put them all on a wall and I admire them. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to wonder whether your children, do they play the guitars? Uh, they do and they all sing. I mean, everybody in my family, my, my kids, my sister's kids, they've all been in a cappella groups in their respective universities and they all sing. And my daughter, my first daughter, this is something I think they may have swapped babies in the hospital. My older daughter actually sings in a bluegrass band yeah. in Brooklyn. And every time she sings, you know, you know bluegrass music, they tell stories that are quite pro, you know, provocative and evocative. So that's the way I put it. So I listen to her and I go, Preetha, what are you singing about? She said, well, it's about life in Kentucky and what happened. And I said, they must have swapped babies in the <laughs> hospital because <laughs> that's one genre of music I never really sang. And yeah. she belts it out like she grew up there. We still got time. Oh, no, <laughs> I'm way over the hill. <laughs> so you talk, in your, you, you talk in your book about an incident in 2009 when you were with President Obama and Prime Minister Modi from India. And Prime Minister Singh. Prime Minister Singh. Just reflect back on that, on that moment and what did that mean for you when that conversation took place? Hmm. We had Tell something called it. the US-India CEO Forum. Mm. And uh, the U.S. had picked about 10 CEOs to speak for the U.S. And then India had picked 10 CEOs to represent India. And we would meet once a year in the U.S. and once a year in India. And this was a meeting in the U.S. And 
after the meeting is over, the president and the prime minister usually come and meet both teams and hear us talk about what we discussed. And at this particular meeting, President Obama was in introducing his entire team to Prime Minister Singh. When it came to me, he said, this is Indra Nui, CEO of PepsiCo. And Prime Minister Singh said, oh, but she's one of us. Yeah. And then Prime Minister Obama looked at him and said, yeah, but she's one of us too. So here I was in the middle of these two world leaders uh, belonging in both worlds. And in a way, I think my entire life has been full of this duality. Yeah, and how do you live with that duality? Because you, when you stepped away from India, you stepped away to advance your education. Did you, did you feel that you needed to go back to fulfill childhood promises? Um, you, remember, I was born eight years after independence. I was born long, long, long time ago. There were no promises at that time. India didn't know who it was. It was mm. just emerging. And the role of women was just being defined. And um, the fact that I was educated and I went on to do a postgraduate degree in India was pretty unusual. Mm. And so once I got the US bug, put it that way, there was no looking back. Mm. And uh, to me, this, I was born and brought up in all my early years in the world's largest democracy, even then. Mm. And I thrived in the world's oldest democracy. So to me, democracy was the common denominator between both. And I feel a sense of responsibility to India in one way. All the schools that educated me, I've gone back and given generously and rebuilt mm. chemistry labs, physics labs, women's lounges, computer systems. I've done everything to upgrade Holy Angels Convent, Madras Christian College, uh, All Saints School, which is where my husband went to school. So they all are now wonderful, wonderful educational institutions. They were then, I've made them even better now. Could you give us a visual picture of what it was like around your home as a child? And if you went back there now, what would it be like? Um, so I met somebody from Madras recently who said, I read your book and nothing has changed. And I said, that's not possible. He said, mm. no, really, life really hasn't changed much in Madras in the homes that we were brought up in. Uh, I was privileged to be, have been born and brought up in a large house hmm. because my grandfather, when he retired as a judge, took his entire pension and built this whole ha big house. But we were comfortable but not wealthy. People would look at us and say, my God, you should be incredibly wealthy to live in this big house. But pretty much every part of the house was rented out to some people because we needed the income to maintain that property. And my father worked in a bank with a very steady paycheck which didn't pay too much. So it was not a corporate career. Mm. Um, and my mother always had this responsibility that she had to pay for two daughters' weddings. So whatever was the equivalent of a South Indian dowry and then the wedding. So she was very conscious of having to save for that big occasion. Uh, so we lived frugally, as most families did in those days. Uh, and uh, the focus was on education. We had freedom as girls, but freedom within a frame. Nice. Um, and there was discipline within a frame. And if you violated the terms of that frame, mm. you were toast. Mm. But as long as you lived within the frame, it was all right. I think the biggest benefit we had was the men in our family said, these girls should be allowed to do whatever they want to do. We're yes. not going to get them married at age 18. Yes. They can dream, they can soar, they can do whatever. Yeah. And there was my mother who would have been CEO had she been allowed to study and been born in the modern times, but she didn't go to college because her family couldn't afford to send her to college. And so she lived her life vicariously through the daughters. Mm. So that was her foot on the accelerator. And then society said the girls had to get married at 18. So that was the foot on the brake. Mm. So she played this interesting role constantly. So I talked about this duality Growing up at the break and the accelerator was also a duality. And when you think about that now, you would probably affirm that as great strengths for you? I would say so. Mm. I would say so. I mean, I couldn't do that to my kids. Mm. Uh, it has to be an accelerator all the way. Go yeah. so, do whatever you want. Don't try to control us, mom. Um, but I think implicitly they understand that there has to be some discipline yeah. and some frame. Um, I think I am a product of my upbringing mm. uh, and a product of uh, having come here and also allowed to soar. Yes. 
You, you talk uh, in your book, but you always talk a lot about the two things that define you are your family uh, and your responsibilities in business uh, as a leader. How, how have you been able to hold it together? Many don't manage to achieve that. Uh, they sacrifice family, they treasure the business, but you've been able to hold both. I mean, it depends on what you mean by hold both. Uh, I've stayed married to the same person for mm. 42 years, so that's holding it together, that's a huge I guess. Achievement. <laughs> I think a lot of credit goes to him too. Um, and I have two kids who've turned out okay, so that's, I guess, yeah. the luck of life also. Um, but I don't believe there's a balance that happens. You sort of juggle work and family all the time. I, I was making trade offs every day, sometimes every hour of the day. Mm. Because you know you plan to have you know an uninterrupted time at the office for five hours, and suddenly a call comes from school. Your daughter sprained her ankle. All of a sudden, yeah. those five hours are mm. just set aside. You go to the school, figure out what's up. So I think, as a mother in particular, somehow the call always comes to the mother. Okay, as a mother, you learn how to juggle. You learn how to multiplex. You mm. learn how to. Focus on one thing, but there's a second track running through your head. Uh, that's the other job you're doing. So I learned to have three or four tracks in my head all the time and somehow allow them to coexist in the head without overwhelming me. That was a skill that one had to develop. Was there ever a moment that you can recall where there was a fight between the office and the family? I wouldn't call it a fight, but it was a... Um, how do I make the choice? Uh, mm. I'll give you one example. Uh, way back, I think in uh, 2000 or 99, when I was president, I had to go to South Africa for a major transaction, which I had to sort of finalize. And the pl trip had been planned meticulously over a long period of time. My little one, who was 18 months old at that time, 18 months or two years, um, got Lyme disease, you know, you know what Lyme disease is, and she was in the hospital. And it was detected very late, and she was in the hospital for seven days. Mm. I didn't leave the hospital for seven days. Mm. I lay next to her, I mean, I, the doctor thought I was nuts, but I didn't leave her yeah. aside for seven days. But on the eighth day, I had to go to South Africa. Now she's being discharged and taken home. So should I cancel South Africa and stay home or say, I was with her for seven straight days. Yeah. And now my husband, my husband and my mother can take over. I agonized over that decision for many, many hours. And then I said, look, I'm not going to carry guilt. I was with her for seven days. I didn't go to the office. I focused on her. Mm -hmm. I hope she carries that memory through. And let me not beat myself up about having to go to South Africa. And I went to South Africa. And I didn't think twice about it. Hmm. But for a brief moment, am I a good mother? Am I doing the right thing? Oh. Uh, why is this job taking me to South Africa? I chose to go to South Africa. I'm going. So if other mothers who are executives, and there are many, many women in executive positions now, if they would ask you the question, would you be straight with them and say, go with your children? No. I'd say go with the trade-off that makes sense for you at that point. Yeah. Um, I think a family is both members, both heads of the family, husband mm. and wife. Mm. It cannot be that the wife makes all the trade-offs mm. and all the sacrifices and the husband essentially has a clean run at work. It just cannot be that way. At least it's my belief. It, I'm not imposing my point of view, I'm just telling you what I think. In our family, it's an absolutely equal marriage. Uh, Raj and I sit down and we look at our schedules for six months, even today, mm. six months out. We update it almost every two weeks and say, uh, you know, let's make sure when we were younger, one of us was home every night for the kids. Yeah. So the kids were never with babysitters or members of the extended family, even one night without one of us there. So we were that way pretty good parents. Mm. Um, we provided for our kids in every which way. But was I as a mom there all the time? No. But was I there at every critical moment? Yes. Mm. And I have no regrets. You know, Michael, I tell you, recently I've been talking to a lot of young women who gave up their jobs and decided to be stay-at-home mothers. 
I commend them because the work of a stay-at-home mom is way more than that of a mm. CEO. I tell you that because mm. I have other people to talk to. Yes. I have other adults I can chat with. I am not on 24 hours. A stay-at-home mother, I tried that for three days and I could not do it. <laughs> I could not, I'm telling you, after three yeah. days, yeah. I was ready to go back to work. Yeah. There is no break, okay? But you can't expect the entire burden to be carried by the stay-at-home mom. Those moms I talked to recently, all were college educated, all mm. gave up their jobs after a year or two and decided to be stay-at-home moms. Ten years later, they can't get back into the workforce mm. and they are deeply sad that they did not stay with the job. Families are fragile, families are messy. You never know when a family situation changes. Mm. And when that happens, it's very hard for the woman to be left without resources, having to take care of kids. So I hear these mothers tell me that we need the economic freedom, we need the power of the purse. And I think at some point, we have to think about these issues through the eyes of the woman too. Has it led you to any organizational solutions for women who have children while they're in executive office or, or developing their careers? Is there something companies should do? We, I think more and more companies are doing this and we were doing it at PepsiCo. You have an on-ramp, you have an off-ramp if you want to leave mm. the job for a couple of three years. And then there's a return ramp. Now, if you're out for 10 years, it's very hard mm. to return. Be with a cohort group that's much younger and then not really know what's going on in terms of trends in the company and its environment. But if you're out for about four or five years and the company keeps you abreast of what's yes. going on in the yeah. industry, there's a way to come back. Yeah. So I think more and more people with the talent shortage we have today are talking about return ramps, especially for people who've sort of kept up to date as to what's going on in mm -hmm. the world and want to really come back. It is happening in more ways than I realized. Now, you, I'm sure you'd agree that you've probably got the ultimate who's who in terms of executive positions, president and CEO of Pepsi, you're on the boards of Amazon and Philips and involved with MIT. But the one I found the most interesting was, was this one, your chair for the study of leadership, the class of 1951 at the US Military Academy at West Point. Mm. Does tell us about that. Well, about uh, two years before I stepped down as CEO of PepsiCo, uh, West Point had invited me to just give a talk to their cadets. So I went there and had a lovely afternoon at the military academy. It's my first trip to West Point. But uh, the, the funny part is, uh, those of you who've been in the military know this. For me, it was new. Uh, when I'd walk around with Colonel Spain, who was the head of the behavioral sciences department, every cadet would salute him. Mm. So I came back to the office and said, guys, you know, salute me. You know, I'm the CEO of the company. They said, get a life, okay? So nobody saluted me, so it didn't work. But I say this is a joke, please don't take this seriously. But the discipline of the place, mm. the dedication, the devotion of those kids. And I was talking to the graduating class and many of them were being deployed. And this was, you know, still wartime. And I'm looking at these faces of these kids and saying, they're all 22 year old kids. My kids are older than these kids. And they're gonna go put their life on the line for the country. And you know, when you go through that sort of an experience, you develop a whole new sense of responsibility mm -hmm. for what you can do to give back. So the day the announcement went out that I was stepping down, literally that day, a letter came from West Point saying, could you please take on this class of 1951 chair for the study of leadership? It's an endowed chair by the class of 51, but nobody takes money from the endowment. Yeah. It's a position. So I spend 16 days a year at West Point, and um, I give seminars, I sit in classes, and I sort of bring the practical perspective to classes. Mm. Um, I go to US Maps, which is the preparatory school for West Point. I have a class that I mentor there. Um, uh, I have forums, the women's forums, the faculty forums that I do special seminars for. It was a two-year term. They made me stay on one more year. And as I said to Colonel Spain, who heads it up, it doesn't matter if I'm an endowed chair or not. I'm in West Point for life. Yeah. So just call on me anytime you need something. So I'm spending a lot of time with those people and um, you know, 
personally and professionally. And I love teaching there. Is there anything you've observed about the kind of leadership training that you've seen at West Point and that you've even spoken about at West Point that you think our students here should know? Um, you know, these are young kids who grew up in, uh, not, not in families who've traveled the world. Many of them have never traveled outside mm. of their home cities. All high performance, high achieving kids. They come to West Point and they know they're going to be deployed to countries far and wide. Uh, you know, I met kids who, go, who were going to go to Iraq and Afghanistan and Kuwait and every part of the world. Um, and I was sitting in on a negotiations class where uh, these 22-year-old kids or 21-year-old kids were sitting with people dressed up as Afghani warlords or Afghani um, tribal chiefs, and they had to negotiate safe passage for citizens to go and vote. And I'm sitting here going, these are 21 and 22 year olds hmm. who are being, who grew up in fairly, uh, you know, uh, sheltered environments. Now we're gonna send them out to foreign countries yeah. and they have to negotiate with warlords yeah. on how to get uh, safe passage for people to vote. That is an awesome responsibility. Huge. But they're doing it today, yeah. these kids. And what West Point does is teaches these kids so much. These kids study all the time. Mm. And a lot of the material, I looked, uh, looked at all of it uh, in the leadership department, is MBA level material. Mm. It's not basic stuff. These kids are learning very advanced stuff. Now, I think because you've picked the absolute best and brightest, they're capable of getting to that. And people like me come and give them a practical perspective. Um, I think if I had my choice, which I don't in this case because it's the US military, the armed forces, I wish it was a longer program mm. so that they could take more time to learn all those aspects. But it's a four year course and they have to be deployed. Is one of the implications of what you said about their age and the kind of MBA style of content that, that we should push harder on academic thinking and leadership thinking? I'm not sure. I wouldn't push harder. Uh, I think people have to be given a chance to mature and evolve. Um, pushing harder and getting academic brilliance instilled into you is not enough. Mm. Those kids are thrown into the deep end of the pool very early. So they're getting it through fire. Um, I don't think in real business we can do that. But we can expect more. We can expect more. But don't try to teach too much. And one of the other responsibilities you've taken recently is to be a council member of His Royal Highness Prince William's Earthshot Prize. Mm. And the first awards were made just yeah. a week ago. Five awards of one million pounds each. And uh, I was watching it live when it happened. Just, t just tell us about your, your sense of understanding around climate change. And as you think about the conversations that are happening now, uh, just be blunt, brutal with us. What have we got to do to square up to this challenge? I think the first thing is get involved in the science. Hmm. I mean, don't listen to the hype, just listen to the science. Read the science, read for yourself. Read both sides if you want, but make sure you pause and think hard about the consequences because when the proof comes, it's going to be too late. When the proof comes, it's going to be too late. And so it's going to take years to address climate change issues. And it, there is no harm addressing the issues even if you don't believe the science. Yeah. Yeah. So my only point is we can ill afford not to address the issues. I mean, I think of things like water, you know, water basins, aquifers drying up in so many parts of the world. Uh, because trees are being cut down at alarming rates. Uh, temperature levels are going up in certain areas where it's very hard to get rainfall to fall in areas mm. that you mm. need for it to fall. And when it comes, there's a deluge and then there's a runoff. So all of this is going to cause wars over water. So it's not just climate change, it's the geopolitical consequences of climate change that are going to be very, very severe. So I think the time has come for action. The problem is all the steps we need to take yeah. are not particularly um, acceptable to many because mm. it feels like, why are you questioning our freedoms? Why are you taking them away? Or 
it means a more expensive alternative. Uh, people don't like that. Unfortunately, we've spent years destroying the environment. We have to find a way to restore the environment. Mm. The environment is which we all live in, is what we live in. So we are destroying our bubble, if you want to call it that. And there's no point trying to make a home in the moon and Mars if we don't fix the planet mm. we are in. Mm. And uh, I think going to moon and Mars is going to take a century for real people to live. We can fix this planet earlier. And I think what was spectacular about the Earthshot Prize was that it was like a Nobel Prize yeah. for the environment. And uh, I got to know William a little bit more, Prince William, and he is so knowledgeable and so dedicated and so involved. Uh, it's quite different than what people think of mm. the royal family. Really, really, really good guy. So I saw uh, Prince William as a environmentalist, as a somebody who feels deeply for the future of humanity and working with uh, Sir Richard Attenborough, what he did to bring focus to the message, raise the funds, because he's raised the money for yeah. 10 years of Earthshot Prize money. It's a lot. It's a lot of money. Yeah. And the book he's written uh, as a, a, a parallel a book for the Earthshot Prize is brilliant, eminently readable, and something everybody should try to get their hands mm. on. And the TV programs that go with oh, it. Oh, it was fantastic. The films, the films that I saw on overfishing and what happens when you cut down too many trees, deplete the rainforest, it was just brilliantly produced. As a CEO, you were able to do something about water issues at PepsiCo. Just, would you say that every CEO needs to look at their product outcomes, their supply chain, the structures of their possible impacts, and, and really adjust that to meet the climate challenge? I don't think we have a choice because mm. if we keep doing what we're doing and then expect somebody else to pick up and fix it, mm. that's a terrible, terrible uh, scorecard on corporate CEOs. So the example I always give is we used to use two and a half liters of water to make a liter of soft drinks. Mm. Just think about it. And we had plants in many parts of the world which were water distressed basins. I grew up in Madras in India which was incredibly water distressed. But there was a Pepsi plant in the outskirts of Madras, and it was a race to who would put in the pump that went into the aquifers deeper. And that bothered me. So I said, tell you what, we're going to lower the water use in our plants substantially. And on top of that, we're going to train communities to be better water stewards. So we went to some towns in India and ran an experiment where we said, if we want this town to be water neutral, how do we manage the town. So we reduced the water use in our plants from two and a half liters. We brought it down to 1.5 on our way to 1.2, for which we got the Stockholm Water Prize, which is like a Nobel Prize for water reduction. But then we taught the town how to do rainwater harvesting. We changed the paddy irrigation methods. So rather than do this manual plowing uh, and transplantation where you flood the paddy fields, we could plow the field much more evenly so that when you flood the field, you didn't have yeah. deep ravines where the water went in. Uh, we taught them how to build check dams to collect the water, low cost methods. But by doing that, you made the town water neutral mm. uh, and then water positive. So we've been replicating these, uh, PepsiCo has been replicating these experiments all over the world. And uh, if companies don't lean in to do that, it's going to be a problem. Mm. The same thing with plastics. If we don't reduce one way, throw away plastic, habits, which is the predominant convenience uh, method today, I think we can do as much as we can to recycle the plastic, but we're going to be filling the pipeline constantly with yeah. plastic. Yeah. So there's a push and a pull that both need to be addressed. Consumer behavior has to change, and companies have to be very responsible about what they do with their one-way plastics, their carbon footprint, and their water use. You've been a very active member of Chief Executives for Corporate Purpose, uh -huh. um, and and you'll remember that the Business Roundtable in the U.S. a couple of years ago redefined the role of business, and and you were very instrumental in that. As you, if you had business executives sitting here now mm. who are young entrepreneurs heading into the future, what would you say to them about their purpose and the profits that they seek to drive? I think the thing to be very very careful about is. 
what is implied when people say focus on stakeholders. Mm. People today believe that if you focus on stakeholders and not just shareholders, it means you're going to deliver lower profits. It means you're going to take richly deserved profits by shareholders and give it away to a flaky group of other people. That's the way it's mm. always been interpreted. That's dead wrong. Yeah. Okay. So let me redefine what purpose should be and how it should be viewed. Um, and I'll use PepsiCo as an example. When we articulated performance with purpose, this was not about giving away the money we made. It was about making money a different way. So we looked at the future and we said, health and wellness trends are you know, mm. becoming more and more uh, uh, you know, uh, primary in uh, consumers' minds. Environmental issues are beginning to dominate all the conversations. There's a war for talent. People don't want to work in consumer industries. They want to work in tech. So what if we changed how we did things in the company? We're still going to be a high-performance company. But what if we changed our portfolio of products mm. to move from just sort of treat-like products to better for you, good for you? Yeah. And even make the treat-like products a bit healthier by reducing the salt, fat, and sugar in treat-like products. What if we really focused on environmental sustainability and reduced our plastic use, water use, and our carbon footprint? And what if we made PepsiCo a great place to work so the best and brightest want to come to work? Now, what are the financial consequences? By changing our portfolio, we could deliver results for a longer period in time because we'd keep our growth going. By reducing our environmental footprint and reducing the plastics use, etc., we kept getting a license to operate in different parts of society instead of being thrown out. And our costs came down over time. And by getting in the best and the brightest, we got the best thinking mm. and we could keep the company growing. So performance and purpose reinforce each other. Yeah. And that's how we should look at purpose, not saying uh, purpose is something that takes today's money for uncertain outcomes in the future. Mm. Um, the fear that, thank you. <laughs> the fear that I have is purpose is viewed as let's fill out 50 metrics in the ESG. Yeah. Yeah. That is not purpose. Yeah. Okay, don't look at ESG as, oh my God, who came up with these metrics? Let's throw them away. Yeah. Look at these ESG metrics through the eyes of other people, through the yes. eyes of other people. Um, I'll just give you a brief story here. Uh, there was a NGO that was very upset about PepsiCo and human rights in the supply chain. Because they said, um, you're working with people who are using slave labor and plantations in Indonesia. Uh, it's not sustainable palm oil. I mean, they were very vocal about it, okay? Uh, when I was coming to the office, my driver said, um, there's a whole bunch of them waiting outside the PepsiCo campus, so let me take you through a back door mm. so you don't have to see them. I said, no, I want to meet them. Mm. I want to go right through the front door. I'm going to invite them in. I'm going to chat with them. Mm. He said, you absolutely don't want to do that. I said, yes, I do. I mean, yeah. I, I, I'm the CEO. I'm going to do it. <laughs> so I met them, I invited them in, had a cup of coffee with them. I listened to what they had to say. Yes. And you know what, they were all young people, as old as my kids. And my kid, my, one of my daughters at that time was working for the Environmental Defense Fund. Mm. To me, they all, they all looked like they worked for the EDF. You know, idealistic, wanted to make a point, wanted to make the world a better place, and making sense on the dollar relative to me. So. Who am I to sit here and say, I'm not going to listen to them? Hmm. I listened to them. At the end of the conversation, they understood my point of view. I understood their point of view. We will never be friends, they and I, because hmm. their goal in life is to attack me. Hmm. And my goal in life is to slowly respond to them. But I came back and I said, we're going to accelerate our response to this issue. Because if you walk a mile in the shoes of all of these well-meaning yes. environmental people or obesity police, or whoever, whatever name we want to give them, they actually want to do the right thing by yes. society. Yes. They are our future. They're those yeah. kids who are wanting a better world in the future. I think the outcome will be very different. So I think we have to look at this whole issue differently. I think when you become a corporate CEO, you shouldn't become jaded. Yes, and disconnected. And disconnected, yeah. Would your observation be that that mode of being amongst CEOs is changing? openness, willing to listen, adaptability? I think as long as there's external pressure, mm -hmm. there's willingness to change. I honestly believe there's two kinds of CEOs. CEOs have lived with a problem all their lives and therefore feel they have to change. Yeah. 
and CEOs, and those CEOs also tend to be those that have a great conscience and sense of purpose. And then there are CEOs who react well to external pressure. Yeah. And there's a third group that says, I don't care, I'm gonna do my own thing. I think I'm not gonna worry about the third group, but there's a large percentage. The second group responds well to external pressure. So if investor pressure keeps up, things would get better. The first group is a small one who really feel, have mm. felt the issue in, mm. in their childhood or they're growing up and want to make the change. Let's hope that number grows. I don't know what's going to make it grow, but I hope it does. So let's just go back to your love of music. Mm -hmm. And in your book, My Life in Full, um, you've, got, you've got tracks from the Beatles, Bee Gees, Beach Boys, James Taylor, Art Garfunkel. You, you talk about them as though they, music feeds your soul. Just what is that? Just talk us through that experience for you, of how important music has become and how does it refresh you day in, day out? You know, when people talk about meditating or taking breathing exercises to calm down when you're agitated, to me it was always music. Mm. Uh, it was always finding that right song to play softly and mm. then having it sort of run as one of those tracks I talked about in my brain. Um, in the worst moments when I want to yell or I just want to tell somebody you're so full of it, I'm sitting back going, okay, turn on that song in the brain and it just plays and uh, it just calms me down. There's something about music that just, I don't know, it's magical. Do you always have it on? I always have it on. Mm. Wonderful. It must be playing in your mind even right yeah, now. It does. Don't ask me which one, though, you know, I don't know. <laughs> So all of our students here, they must, they will, I know they will look at your life with a sense of real awe and huge respect. So you've achieved so much and you will continue to achieve so much. So just help them to understand the values, the principles that you've embedded into you, where you got them from, and how do you maintain them with all the opportunities you've got? How do you keep steady in this direction of life? Um, you know... My life has been defined by my family and my work. And all of the teachings of my grandfather, who basically said, if you promise to deliver something, just deliver it. Reliability is what your hallmark should be. Integrity is everything. Don't ever, uh, you know, he'd always say, integrity is zero or 100. You can never say somebody's got 95% integrity. That doesn't exist. And so all of these lessons sort of dig deep you know, find their way into the recesses of your head. My father would say things like, uh, assume positive intent, which is very hard to do, very, very hard to do, but anybody you meet, even when you fight with your spouse, assume positive intent. I don't want to, but I gotta, okay? Um, and so uh, it's uh, assuming positive intent. The famous uh, Greek uh, Epictetus' uh, statement on you've got two ears and one mouth, use it in that proportion. So all of these statements that were repeated to me so many times as a kid when I was growing up sort of stay in your head. Mm. And um, uh, whether you like it or not, you can't shut it off. So you've schooled yourself in understanding and... I think people around me schooled me, mm. and they, were, they just stuck there, I mean, etched into the, uh, the crevices of my head. And so at every point in time, you draw upon that, because you need to draw upon some strength. You draw upon those to say, like last night, we talked about the adventure of getting here. There was no question in my head mm. of not getting, I mean, there was not even a doubt in my head. I was going to get here whatever happened. Mm. Uh, and uh, cancellation of a flight, be damned, I was going to get here. And so, uh, you know, it's like my grandfather saying, if you promise something, you better deliver it. And I wouldn't miss this for the world. And so I think many people sort of put this by the wayside and say, eh, I couldn't make it, tough luck. Um, it's not tough luck. Think of the people you're disappointing. Yeah. Think of what you said you would do. And um, look, if you were desperately ill and you couldn't make it, I can understand. But this was not that sort of situation. Um, so at every point in time, you know, the, the best way to explain it is this way. My husband always says to me, let me tell you your list, Indra. He says it's PepsiCo, PepsiCo, PepsiCo. 
then your kids, you know, when he's upset, they're my kids, then your mother, and then somewhere in the bottom, I'm on the list. <laughs> yeah. And I tell him, you're on the list, though. Yeah. I tell him, you're on the list. So that's the way you should look at it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I have to tell you, what he articulated when I was CEO, those were my priorities, and I'll tell yeah, you why. Yeah. I had 260,000 employees and their families mm. that depended on PepsiCo. Mm. 260,000 employees. Mm. I had suppliers, customers, and their families that all depended on PepsiCo. Mm. So when I ascended to the CEO chair and I took that on, I knew that I had a duty of care to the company and this ecosystem. So it was paramount in my head. My kids came right after. Even though at times, as I said, I made trade-offs and they mm. bubbled to the top, my kids were always in that one track in my head. My mother is my life. She's old. She's the person who took care of me mm. and my kids. And moms are special. So my mother's there. My husband doesn't need to belong to a list. He knows that. Yeah. But by saying this, he's drawing attention to the fact that when you have a high-powered career, as a husband or a wife, the person that hurts the most is the spouse. Yeah. You know, and I say this to the men too. It's the spouse that gets ignored the most. And as a woman, it's the husband that gets ignored the most. That's a reality because you assume they will understand everything. Hmm. And I assume that uh, from my husband all the time saying, I don't have time for you because the kids need me. I don't have time for you because I have a crisis in PepsiCo. And he's doing the same to me. He's now an acting CEO of a world NGO called Plan, which you know is based mm -hmm. in London. Mm -hmm. He's on the phone from 4 a.m. in the morning mm -hmm. to 6 p.m. in the night. You can't even get a word in edgewise. The house may be burning down. He'll say, I got a problem in XYZ country. Don't talk to me. Yes. <laughs> so I can look, look at him and say, how does it yeah. feel to be a CEO? Yeah. You know, tables have turned. Yeah. But, um, and I, I might as well not exist for him because he's so busy. <laughs> but that's okay. Mm. That's the implicit pact we have between us that we will support each other through thick and thin. Mm. So if marriages can be as strong as that, um, I think both members of the family can in fact mm. contribute equally and be successful. That's very, very, very precious. As you just, now Pepsi's gone, okay. but you've got all these other wonderful joys mm. in, in your life. Just in this the last minute or so, just give us your sense of vision for the future. Who is Indra going to be in the next decades? You know, the last two and a half years since I retired has been a whirlwind of activity mm. because I actually thought I was going to retire and my husband and I were going to travel, uh, spend more time with the kids. We had all these plans because it's been 40 years of just running. And then the day after I retire, the governor of Connecticut calls me. He and I went to school together. Oh, Indra, obviously going to be the co-chair of um, the Connecticut Economic Development. And I go, okay, I'll help you out. So started that job. A year later, the pandemic comes about and he says, obviously going to co-chair reopen Connecticut with this epidemiologist. Now that's my state and I want the state to do well. So okay, I'll co-chair reopen Connecticut. So. Meanwhile, I'm writing this book about how to change the world for women and young family builders, which started out as policy papers and ended up with the book. And so for the last two and a half years, I've been busier than I was at PepsiCo. The only mm. difference is it's on Zoom. Yes. That's yes. the only difference. <laughs> I am on all the time between mm. my ICC job, which you know, it takes a lot of time, uh, Amazon, Philips, I sit on the board of Sloan Kettering, the cancer center, and then everything I do for Connecticut and West Point, it has just consumed my time. Mm -hmm. The book is behind me now, so I think now my next step is to bring the book to life. Yes. The moonshot, you know, what do we need to do to help young family builders actually have a support structure so that they can actually have kids and engage in paid work? Mm -hmm. Because if you think like an economist, the country needs all the best yeah. talent deployed in the service of the economy. And we need them to have children, so how do we help them do both? Well, you're a remarkable leader. 
<laughs> I'm so grateful you're not on Zoom and you're actually here. Totally. Please is. join me in thanking Andrew. Thank Roy you. For, uh, Thank you. Yeah,